All right. Well, good morning to you all. Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Andy. I'm the youth pastor here at the church, and we are so happy that you're with us this morning. Uh, we also wanted to say happy Father's Day uh, to the fathers that are out there. Uh, we're so thankful for you, uh, for the way that you lead your families and for the way that you uh, lead here in our church. Uh, happy Father's Day to you all. Uh, and there are donuts uh, for dads uh, down in, uh, down in the, the fellowship hall. So after service, if you want to stop by and grab a donut, uh, they're down in the fellowship hall. Uh, happy Father's Day to you all. Uh, we really are blessed by you guys. Uh, but uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, if you are a member and have been for a long time, we're thankful that you're here. If you are a first-time guest here at the church, uh, we're also thankful uh, that you're here. Uh, we're really excited to get to worship together this morning. Uh, but first, uh, had something that we wanted to do this morning. Uh, our kids' ministry uh, are leaving for summer camp on Friday. Uh, so we're really, really excited for that. Uh, I've got the list of who all has signed up for that here on my phone. I, uh, we wanted to pray for them, uh, for the people that are, for the kids and the lead, their leaders that are going to camp. Uh, we're really, really excited. They're going to camp at Centrikid uh, in Campbellsville, Kentucky. Uh, and it's going to be a great, great time. So uh, if you're going to Centricid, uh, would you stand up where you're at? If you're going to Centricid, so several, in the, if you're a leader even that's going to Centricid. Uh, so that is Zoe Beth Cottle, Zoe Dolan, Mel Williams, Gideon Williams, Rachel Foote, Velma Foote, Jonah Collard, Zola Collard, Michaela Kearns, Andy Kaiser, Peyton Shoemate, Jordan Shoemate, Kingston uh, Jessica Woods, Jen Foote, uh, myself, and then Vanessa Kaiser. Uh, so we're really, really excited for uh, Kids Ministry Camp. And again, that starts this Friday and through Sunday. So uh, we ask for your prayers, and, and you all stay standing where you are. Uh, and we want to pray for uh, our kids that are going to camp. So would you join me? Would you pray there at your seat? Uh, and would you join me as I pray for our kids and our leaders that are going to camp? Father, we... Uh, come to you today uh, excited, excited that so many kids uh, are fired up about camp, are fired up to get to go and to get to study your word, uh, to get to sing uh, fun songs and have uh, just fun games and different things. God, we're uh, excited that they are excited. Uh, that brings us joy, uh, the excitement of, of kids, God. Uh, so God, we pray for the group that's going. We pray for safe travel on the way there and on the way back. Uh, we pray for uh, the time that is to be had there. God, we pray that they would have uh, a great time, that they would uh, continue to realize uh, that we find joy in the presence of the Lord, uh, that in the Lord there's fullness of joy. God, I, I pray that they would continue to experience that. I pray that, uh, that decisions will be made to follow Jesus uh, if they're not following Jesus, God, and that if they are, are already following Jesus, that they would grow deeper and deeper in their knowledge and understanding of God, uh, of you and, his, and your word. Uh, God, I pray for uh, the adults that are going. Uh, God, give them uh, energy when they're tired. God, uh, um, uh, lead them, use them to, uh, through uh, your leading, make an impact on the kids that are going to be in attendance. Uh, God, we are so excited, uh, and we give you all the glory, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're really excited for Kids Camp, but I wanted to start this morning by reading a passage of Scripture, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and Paul writes this, uh, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of God. Uh, would you stand with me this morning as we worship him together? Good morning. We want to invite you to worship, worship with us this morning. We've come to worship him through song and through his word, um, through worship and um, we worship a God who is almighty, and he is never changing. Even though the world, there's things constantly change, he is faithful to his promises that he gives us in the word. So let's sing to him because he is worthy this morning.
stand against the power of our God. You shine like the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of
greater. And this morning, this next song, I want us to sing this out to him. I want us to be our prayer as we, as we worship him. That he would open our eyes, that he would renew our minds, that we would be more like him, that we would know him more. open up our hearts to you this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, and we pray all this in your name. Amen.
ushers can come forward, and our deacon of the week, uh, Brother Bill Edwards, uh, will come with us in prayer. Did you notice my wife just got flowers? <laughs> That's because today's her birthday. <laughs> Not only that, it's our 52nd wedding anniversary. <laughs> uh, can, can you believe she's lucky enough to get me for a birthday present? <laughs> but I'm glad she got me. I really don't know what I'd do without her. In uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We just, uh, <clears throat> we ask that you would uh, be with our pastor and his family at this time and, and uh, just give them uh, healing or uh, make them well again and also those that need your uh, healing and comforting hand lord just both physical and spiritual we just lift them up to you we ask, lift up this offering to you lord and uh, uh, we just ask that you would take it and use it we don't know what you have in store for it but we just ask that you would use it to make your kingdom even greater we ask all these things in jesus name amen If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to the book of James, James chapter 1, and we'll get started there in verse 22 in just a few moments. If, uh, if maybe you're new to the Bible, oh yeah, Children's Church, there we go. I, uh, I was getting a signal in the back, I was trying to, to figure out what it was. Uh, Children's Church, if you were five years old through third grade, you were dismissed for Children's Church. Good deal. Uh, if maybe you're new to the Bible or new to church, uh, James is in the New Testament. Uh, it's kind of getting towards the end of the Bible. Uh, follows Hebrews, comes right before First Peter, uh, or use your table of contents there. Your, their Bible's right in the pew in front of you. I was joking with someone a couple of uh, days or maybe a week ago. I, uh, I had the opportunity last week to preach at Northside Baptist Church in Fairfield. Uh, and it was a great time, uh, and then have the opportunity to preach here this week. And so I'm in the middle of a sermon series. Now, I'm the only person that gets to hear both sermons, but uh, I'm in a, a sermon series of sorts. No, I, uh, I preached on the first part of James 1 last week, so if you want to go watch it on Facebook, you're welcome to. Uh, you don't, don't have to, don't feel obligated. But uh, in the middle of a little bit of a sermon series here on the book of James, uh, but if you know me, uh, you know I like sports. Uh, I, I, I played football. I played baseball all throughout high school. Uh, love sports. Uh, the only problem in high school, uh, I had ter a terrible time.
time when it came to injuries. I had a lot of injuries. Going into my freshman year, I tore my ACL. Uh, going into my, or in my sophomore year, I tore my meniscus. In my junior year, I tore my labrum and my bicep. I uh, just had a terrible time with injuries. Uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't all. I also had a couple concussions. I had a concussion uh, when I was in eighth grade playing football and a concussion when I was a sophomore, or no, junior, I believe, playing football. But I also had a third concussion. And I want to tell you the story. It didn't happen in any organized sport. I want to tell you the story of how I got that concussion uh, today. So my younger sister, uh, she was playing softball, and her team had made it all the way to the World Series uh, that was in Virginia Beach, I believe, Virginia. It was in Virginia. Uh, We got to go on this really cool trip. Um, For her, it was she had to play softball and practice and do all these things. For us, we got to vacation and just watch a couple games of softball every day. So one of these days, my brother and I are at the pool. And I said some words that I would come to regret. I told my brother this, I bet you can't swim from that side of the pool to that side, and back, all underwater. That's what I told my brother, and he was like, it's on, let's do it. And so he does it, he pushes off, he goes this end, he goes back, and he did it like it was no trouble at all. Like it was not, he didn't even come up like breathing heavy, no trouble at all. And then he said this, he said, Andy, I bet you can't do it. I bet you can't do that. So uh, if if any of you have brothers or have siblings, you know if your sibling tells you you can't do something, you're gonna do it. You're going to figure out a way to do it. So get a good push off the side, the first, uh, the first side. So we're going down and back underwater. So I make it down. I'm doing okay, uh, but I'm a little concerned. I'm concerned that I'm not going to be able to make it all the way back underwater. I'm kicking hard. hard I can. Uh, so hard, in fact, that uh, I, I forgot to put my hands out in front of me to, to brace for the wall that was to come. Uh, and again, I'm on the bottom of the pool. We're not swimming on top. We're holding our breath underwater. Uh, and I made it back to the side. And the reason I found out is I swam as hard as I could head first into the side of the pool. I mean, I cracked my head on the side of the pool, swam so hard into the side of the pool. It rang my bell. Uh, it, I saw stars. You can laugh. I, I'll give you permission. Y'all, <laughs> y'all can laugh. Uh, it hurt, but y'all can laugh. I, uh, uh, any expression you want to use there, I had it. So my brother, if you ever talk to my brother, tells a story of what happens next. He says, I came up. He asked me if I was okay, and I said, yes. Uh, he said, I then proceeded to go start talking to a random stranger in the pool like I knew them. Uh, he says, then we went back to the hotel room. Uh, he says, I almost beat him in Madden on the PlayStation, which is a big deal. I never beat my brother in Madden, and who knows, maybe I did today. But the reason I'm telling it from his perspective, I don't remember it. I don't remember it at all. From that point for a, a, a very specific time, I And what we're going to see uh, in James chapter 1 today is James is going to paint a picture. He's going to paint a picture of someone who comes and looks intently at his face in a mirror, walks away, and forgets what he looks like. That's what we're going to read. So James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27. So uh, if you're able, would you stand with me this morning as we read from the Word of God together? James writes, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, And at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is the word of God. You can be seated. I read something this week uh, that called James the in-your-face apostle. And what the, the commentator meant by that is that James is very challenging in his letter. And we see that in what we just read. It's going to be an extremely challenging passage for us this morning, but I'm extremely uh, excited to study it together. So let's, let's pray uh, before we get started. Father, we thank you for uh, this letter 
that James wrote that we're about to take a look at, God, it's challenging, talking about doing more than just hearing the word, but actually doing it, God. So God, I pray that we would uh, just open, open our minds, open our hearts uh, for the message that you have for us this morning. God, I, I thank you for our church. I pray that you would continue working in our church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to look at this passage of scripture this morning under three different headings, three different points, if you will. But first, I wanted to put a little bit of a disclaimer on this passage of scripture. When we read this passage of scripture, we're going to read a lot about doing, a lot about doing. Verse 22, be doers of the word. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. Verse 25, a doer who acts. Verse 26, the one who does not bridle his tongue. There's a lot about doing in this passage of scripture, but there's also a lot about not doing. But let's be sure we get this before we get started. The doing that we're talking about today is because of our faith in Christ. So the doing that we're talking about today is because of our faith in Christ. James addressed this letter to a very certain group of people, to the 12 tribes that are scattered among the nations. That's what you can read in James chapter 1, verse 1. The church is scattered among the nations. Why? Because of persecution. We talked about this last year. If you're... Uh, do I need to switch mics potentially? I'll switch. So the church is scattered among the nations because of persecution. We studied this last year throughout the book of Acts. And if you remember, there was a man named Stephen. And Stephen was one of the seven who was chosen to serve as a deacon in the early church. He was chosen to serve, and he was ultimately killed for his faith and his boldness in the risen Christ. And after that, because of that, as a result of that and the things around that, the church was scattered. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So they were all scattered. These are the people that James is writing to. Christians primarily uh, in the dispersion is maybe how your version of the Bible puts it in James 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, Christians that are scattered among the nations. People that are following Jesus but are scattered among the nations. And there's a lot of doctrinal debate over the book of James. If you Google it, you can find it. There's a lot of debate over the book of James. But if we carefully read it, we see a picture painted that salvation that comes through faith must lead to works. Not the other way around. Those works don't lead to our salvation. We don't, we don't earn our way to salvation. Those works flow out of our salvation. They're a fruit of our salvation. So I want us to notice that as we study this passage of Scripture. And what we see here in James chapter 1 is that James brings up a couple of different types of people, a couple of different types of religion, a couple of different types uh, of, of faith. And so the first thing we're going to look at is the person who is deceived. The person who is deceived, verses 22 through 25, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing." So James says, do the words. Don't be a hearer only. That'd be deceiving yourself. And this is when he paints the picture, the picture of a man who comes and he looks at his reflection in a mirror. He stares at his reflection. He looks intently at his reflection and he walks away and immediately forgets what he looks like. This is when James paints that picture. In other words, what James is saying, what's the point? What's the point? It's, it's pointless uh, reading the word, knowing the word, and not doing what it says. The word of God is perfect. It's, it's without error. And what we read if we study the Bible is that, that the God's word changes us. Paul writes about this in his second letter uh, to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's a very famous passage. It says that all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is literally breathed out by God, and it's useful for things. And he lists a few things. And one of the things that he lists is training in righteousness, that God's word is useful for training in righteousness. 
You see, we were never to intended, we were never intended to read the word of God like we would a work of fiction. But even more than that, we were never intended to read the word of God like we would uh, a, a biography or a history book or things like that. See, we read those things. We read works of fiction. We read a, a, a biography, and we get done with it, and we say one of two things. Either that was good, and we put it on the shelf and probably never come back to it, or that was a waste of my time, and then we put it on the shelf and probably don't come back to it. And that's not how we're intended to read the Word of God. We're intended to read the Word of God uh, very intentionally, we have a, 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 a strategy. We didn't invent it. We just, uh, someone uses it and we've seen it before. And so we, we do it here for our discipleship groups here at the church. And it's called the HEAR method of reading scripture. Maybe you've seen it before different places. And what that means is uh, highlight, explain, apply, and respond. So highlight, read a passage of scripture, highlight what stands out to you, uh, explain what the passage is saying. Uh, how can you apply the truths of this passage to your life? And lastly, how is God calling you to respond in light of this passage? So that's kind of how we read. And, and it's just a way to be intentional in our reading. And not just be reading, but to really be intentional in what we're reading out of the Word of God. Joshua, from the Old Testament, he's someone who we see had great care for the Word of God. He had great care for the Word of God, but also great trust in acting in the Word of God. If you remember Numbers chapter 13, uh, God had Moses send uh, 12 spies into Canaan, the land that was going to come to be uh, the, the, the promised land, the land that the Israelites were going to. He sends 12 spies, uh, and, and their, their job was, tell us how the land is. Are there a lot of people, or are there a few people? Are the people big, or are the people small? So these 12 spies go, and they came back and gave a report of the land. They said, this land is incredible. This land is incredible, so much so that it flows with milk and honey, but their people are strong, their cities are fortified, and we have no chance. That's what 10 of the 12 spies came back and said, if you remember that story from the Old Testament. Two disagreed with them. One's name was Caleb, and one's name was Joshua. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 6 through 9, uh, it says this, Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with them, or was with us. Do not fear them. Joshua had great trust in the Lord, in the word of the Lord, and it led him to confidence in action, is what we see. But it's not just here. Uh, later on, uh, Moses is going to die, Deuteronomy chapter 34, and Joshua is going to be uh, put as leader of the people of Israel. Joshua chapter 1. Uh, in Joshua 1, Joshua gives like a, an inaugural address to the people of Israel. And he says many different things, but one particular verse I want to read for you today. Joshua says this, Joshua 1, 9. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Joshua says, this word of God, it shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night and be careful to do according to, that, to all that is written in it. It's a care for the word of God. And it's a care for doing what the word of God says. James says, be a doer of the word. Don't be a hearer only. Don't deceive yourself. Don't forget uh, what you've been called to. Don't forsake the faith that Christ has called you to. And then he ends that verse, verse 25, by saying you will be blessed in your doing. Secondly, in this passage of scripture this morning, we see religion that is worthless. Religion that is worthless. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone thinks he, thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So we're talking about another action here, but we change it up a little bit. We go from talking about actions a, as a whole, like, like doing what the Word of God says as a whole, to one very specific thing. Controlling our tongue. Controlling our words. James says, or the ESV version says, bridling 
our tongues. Uh, and, and if you're a horse person, I'm not, so if I say this wrong, feel free to correct me after church. Uh, but the bridle is something you use to, to, to guide a horse, to guide a horse wherever you want to go. And James uses that word two different times to talk about being in control of our tongue and in, of our body. He talks a lot about our tongue. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 6, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle, there's that word again, bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies, their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a fire is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. So in, his, in James's description of how deadly the tongue can be, he compares the tongue to a few different things. And the first thing he says is horses, these big animals, and they're controlled by these little bits. Now, I remember reading that when I was a kid. I thought that meant like food. Uh, it's not, I don't think. Again, uh, ask a horse person after church, but bits are the things that go into their houses. And when we kind of tug on the reins, they kind of, or their houses, their mouths, right? <laughs> I don't know where I got houses from. (laughs) Their mouths. Bits are the things that go into their mouths. And when we pull on the reins, kind of apply certain pressure and and make the horse respond in the way that you're leading it to. Again, that's what I read on Wikipedia. Uh, If a horse person wants to to say differently, you could talk to them after church. Uh, um, But bits, this little thing in these big horses control the horses. And then he goes on to talk about boats. These big ships, and they're controlled by what? a small rudder, wherever the pilot wants them to go. And then one that we all get, we all can picture a big forest, and we we see from time to time in the news and different things, forest fires and things like that. How are they started? By a small spark, by a small fire. And James says the tongue is similar. It's a small part of the body, but it can cause great destruction, gossip, slander, taking the Lord's name in vain, putting other people down when we are called to encourage other people and build them up. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs talks a lot about the tongue. It talks a lot about our words. It says that the tongue can lead to sin. It says that the tongue can crush the spirit of others. It says that the the tongue can gush evil. He says that our words can separate close friends. He says that uh, uh, the tongue can lead to calamity, that gossip can lead to quarrels, that the tongue has the power of life and death that words cut like swords, that a harsh word stirs up anger, just to name a few. And it's fitting that a book about wisdom, that a piece of of wisdom literature talks so much about the tongue, so much about our words. And all of this stems from things that we don't feel like are a big deal. Gossip, putting other people down. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul starts, let your speech always be gracious. Let your speech always be full of grace. What we say matters. How we say it matters. And maybe for you, uh, you're sitting here today in a conversation with your kids or your spouse or your, uh, your boss or your employees or your friend is coming to your mind right now. I want to tell you two things this morning. First, uh, God tells us to speak with grace for a reason. And the reason he tells us to speak with grace is because he has poured out an abundance of grace upon us. So for the time you flew off the handle this week, there's grace for you. Uh, God's word says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For the time you flew off the handle, there is grace for you. And secondly, God calls you to repent of that sin, to confess that sin to him but also to make it right. So, so if, you, if you harmed your kids or you harmed your spouse or you harmed uh, a friend or you harmed a coworker with your words, uh, we're called as Christians to go and ask them for forgiveness, to ask for forgiveness when we have hurt someone, apologize for them. And a, a charge, James 1.19, another verse, it's not in our verses this morning. James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. We're never gonna be perfect in this because we're never gonna be perfect. But as we mature spiritually, the Holy Spirit will, will guide us in how we are intended to speak and how we are intended to use our words. And James says here, says here that the worthless religion is that which doesn't control their tongue. 
Lastly, this morning, we're going to wrap up by looking at uh, what you see on the screen, religion that is pure, pure religion. Verse 27, I love this verse. James says this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I want to read that again. A uh, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does God want from us? To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and not just to talk about it. One of my dad and my favorite things to do is to talk about, is to sit and daydream about uh, deer hunts that we want to go on, about hunts that we want to go on someday. Uh, one of the things I want to do, I want to go bear hunting someday. So that's one of the things we kind of talk about. Uh, and smaller things too, like, like we're kind of wanting to, maybe this season or next season, go hunt an old place we call the Fortress Tree down in Pope County that we grew up hunting together. Uh, there's been a hunt we've wanted to do for a while at a place we call the Hamilton Inn uh, back home with our muzzleloaders. Uh, and we just sit, sit around and we talk about these things and we dream about these things. But what happens a lot of times is season gets here, things get busy, and we hunt the same places we hunt every other year. Just kind of do it that way. And my dad has an expression that he always says when that kind of comes to pass. And he read it out of an old hunting book. And the expression is something along the lines of this. Uh, sometimes the best hunt is the one you never get to go on. Sometimes the best hunt's the one you never get to go on. And what he means by that, sometimes part of the fun is sitting around with your friends, sitting around with your family, and just talking about it, just dreaming about things that would be really, really cool. And the reason I say that this morning, if we're not careful, we can be that same way about loving orphans and widows in their distress, loving and caring for those that have been marginalized. We can have good intentions. We can really love them. We can be aiming to do something for them. We can even pray for them. But that's not what James calls pure religion. Those are good things, but that's not what James calls pure religion. He says pure religion is really doing it. Not just talking about it, not just thinking about it, but actually doing it. David Platt says it this way. What a statement. Religion that is pure before God that is acceptable before God is not just sitting in a service, singing songs, studying God's word, gathering together with a church, going through a lot of the things we might picture in the normal Christian life. Religion before God our Father that is pure and undefiled is visiting orphans and widows in their distress. And he continues, that's a powerful word to visit. It's a really fascinating, it's really fascinating when you look at it in the New Testament. It's not just come to somebody, like visit them, drop in and then leave. It's so much deeper than that. To visit someone in the language here in the New Testament is to come to someone with a responsibility to care for them. I found that fascinating when I read that this week. But so caring for orphans, caring for widows is more than just thinking about it. It's more than just meaning well. It's actual uh, commitment to caring for them. That's what's pure before God. That's what's undefiled before God. I was just talking to my dad yesterday, and he was asking what I was planning to preach on this morning, and I was telling him and kind of walking him through the outline that I had and things like that, and he reminded me of a passage of Scripture that went so well with this. Matthew chapter 25. It's a pretty common passage of Scripture. Uh, um, there are sheep and there are goats. The sheep are put to the right of God. The goats are put to the left of God. And to, to the people on the right, uh, they have eternal life with God. They inherit the kingdom, is what Jesus says. He says, uh, Jesus goes on to say, verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And he says to those on his left, remember, he puts the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. He says to those on his left, depart from me. Why? Why did he say that? This is what he goes on to say. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then he goes on to say, for what you have done for the least of these, you've done for me. For what you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. 
Micah says it similarly in the Old Testament, uh, kind of continuing on in the theme of justice being done. Uh, Micah 6, 8. Micah is speaking to the people of Judah. Uh, he's telling them about God's judgment that is coming upon them. Uh, Judah's beginning to, to prosper. And with that, there's a lot of immoral things that are happening. I read this week that uh, the people in, in power were practicing bribery. Uh, they were confiscating the fields of the people, of the, just the normal common people. They were oppressing the poor. They were abusing women and children. And Micah, in, in Micah, the first five chapters, he really just challenges them. He tells them about God's judgment that is coming. And then chapter six, it's kind of like, so what? So what now? And he says this in Micah 6, 6 through 7. After uh, He says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? So in other words, what Micah is saying is you've turned your backs on God. That's what he's talking about for most of, 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 of that book of the Bible. So what now? Should you just do this religious ritual and be good to go? And then Micah says something extremely powerful. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. You've probably read it before. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God, to people, be a people who care about justice being done, to be a people who care about the people who have no one to care for them, but not just to talk about it, not just to think about it, not just to do a religious ritual from time to time, but to actually actively care about the people that are marginalized, orphans, widows, babies that aren't yet born, I, um, women that have been trafficked. That's pure religion. That's religion that is undefiled before God the Father. And I want to close like this this morning. I want to ask you a question. And if you're a note taker, I'd ask you to write this question down. And if you're not a note taker, I'd ask you to consider writing it down too on your hand or a piece of paper or margins of your Bible or whatever. And the question is this. What's God calling me to do that scares me? What's God calling me to do that scares me? Because when God calls us to something that scares us, he calls us to something that we need his help with. So my encouragement, write that question down, ponder it, uh, look at it often, think about it right now, and count the cost. Because of, I believe with my whole heart that God is calling you to something and that he's calling me to something that makes us nervous that takes us out of our comfort zone. And maybe for you, uh, after talking about this, after reading, or maybe just thinking in the weeks, in the previous weeks, maybe for you, you say, God has blessed me in extraordinary ways. And I want to follow his leading, and I want to adopt a kid. Or maybe for you, you say, God has blessed me beyond my wildest dreams, and, and I want to follow his leading by fostering a kid. Or maybe for you, you say, God has blessed me beyond anything I could have ever imagined, and I want to follow his leading by giving to ministries that support orphans. Or maybe for you, you say, God is burdening my heart for the widows in our community, and I want to commit to, to calling them every week. I want to commit to going to see them uh, often, or I want to commit to sending them cards. Or maybe for you, you say, God's burdening my heart for people that are in prison. Uh, and I want to go, God's calling me to go and, and talk to people that are in prison and tell them that there is still hope for them in Jesus Christ. Or maybe for you, God's calling you to, to, to sell your things and to move to, to Hong Kong or somewhere overseas. Or maybe for you, you're 40 years old. You have a, a comfortable job, but God's calling you into full-time ministry. Can I tell you something this morning? This morning? These things won't always lead to personal comfort. They won't always lead to what's easy. But God never promised easy. In fact, he promised trouble. But he also promised good, as in he is working for the good of those who love him. And he also promised his presence, as in surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And what more do we need than the presence of God? 
Paul, uh, Philippians chapter four, uh, he's writing and he's saying, I can face everything. Why? Because Christ gives me strength. Philippians 4, 13. You've probably heard that before. And what Paul is saying there is I can face abundance, I can face need, I can have plenty, or I can be hungry, and I can do it all because Christ gives me strength. What more do we need than the presence of God? So my invitation today, ponder that question. What's God calling you to do that scares you? How is God calling you out of your comfort zone? And then pray about it. Pray about it during this last song that we're about to do. Come here and pray about it. Bring your family. How powerful is it to to have your family come down here and pray about what it is that God is leading you to do? Grab me. I'll be right over there. I'd love to pray with you. Grab one of our deacons. and They'll come and pray with you. Pray about how God is, or what God is calling you to. Maybe you're in here today and you say, I'm, I'm new to church. And I have a question. Why would people care about other people so much that they would do these things? Well, by our own power and by our own strength, we don't. There's a reason we love. And First John says it. John says, we love. Why? Because he first loved us. Jesus loved us so much that he went to the cross for us, that he died on the cross for us in our place, the death that we deserved so that we can have a relationship with him. So if you want to talk, if you say, I've been searching the world, that song we sing a lot says, I searched the world and it couldn't fill me. Maybe that's you today. You say, I've looked for fulfillment. I've looked for hope. I've looked for purpose and everything that this world has to offer. And I can't find it. You'll find it in Jesus. You'll find fulfillment. You'll find purpose. You'll find hope, but not just uh, uh, any hope, not just any hope, not just hope that lasts for this lifetime, eternal hope, living hope. So if you're here today and want to place your trust in Jesus as your Savior, you want to follow Jesus with everything that you have, I'll be right over here uh, during this last song. I'll be over there after service. I'd love to talk with you about how you could become a Christian. But I encourage you, we're about to do one more song. Uh, Respond in the way that the Lord is leading you. If that's through worshiping, then let's worship together during this time. Let's pray, and then we'll worship together. Father, we thank you for this challenging uh, word from James. God, about doing your word. God, I pray that that we would be a church uh, that hears the word, that knows the word, and that does it that we would be a light into our community and that our heart would beat to see lost people in our community come to faith in Christ and to see lost people in our nation come to faith in Christ and to see lost people in our world come to faith in Christ. God, may our heart beat for that. God, we pray for revival in this community, God. God, that we would see people in this community come uh, to faith uh, just often and rapidly, God. And God, I pray that you would give us uh, just the strength to, to disciple them, to teach them how to grow in their faith. But God, we thank you for this word. God, I pray for uh, everyone as we uh, ponder what it is that God is calling us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
remain standing. Oh, forgot. <coughs> you guys can remain standing. A um, couple of things real quick. Uh, there might be some announcements up on the screen. Uh, there are announcements in these uh, programs as you exit. Uh, I believe they come uh, to your emails as well. If you'd like to be added to the email list, uh, you could see me or, or Pat, and we'd love to get you added to that. Uh, the SAC lunch program, this is our week to serve. Uh, for the Carmi SAC lunch program. So uh, if you're interested in helping and hadn't signed up yet, you could see uh, Dixie Anderson somewhere. Uh, okay, in the nursery. Uh, you could see Dixie Anderson, uh, and that would be fantastic. We're excited to be able to uh, live on mission this week and uh, serving lunches to our community. Uh, at this time, our Deacon of the Week, uh, Brother Bill Edwards, will close us in prayer. Perfect. Choir practice, 4.30 uh, in here, which reminds me uh, there will be no prayer meeting tonight uh, due to Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to you all. Bill. Lord, we thank you for your word that we've heard this morning, Lord. And we just ask now that as, as we uh, leave this place that you guide and direct us in all that we do. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.